Welcome everyone, this is Andrew here with your business news for the week, your business breakdown. To start off with, we have some record news for the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. Stocks have been doing really well and November was actually the best monthly gain for the Dow Jones Industrial Average since January 1987. That is a long time ago. And if you look at the other stock indexes like the S&P 500, which returned 11%, and the NASDAQ, which returns 12%, you're seeing a lot of growth in stocks and in stock funds. And a lot of people are making money on these. They're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with the pandemic. People are getting their hopes up and some companies are coming out and adjusting to this new business environment. So that's on the good side. On the other side of that, you have these inverse and leveraged ETF funds that are receiving a lot of money now. So people are moving up the risk spectrum for investing. And there's, there's no yields on anything right now with interest rates at 0%. There's no good bonds. You know, people are trying to get as much kind of leverage they can, which moves them up the risk spectrum to get some type of return on their money. So right now, if you look at how much money is going as inflows into these funds, it's 16.3 billion for inverse ETFs and leveraged funds. So you might have a fund that's like 4X the S&P 500 or something like that. So the problem is, is that a lot of people don't even understand how these leveraged funds work. A lot of the funds have a rebalancing system where they're, they're meant for day traders to be traded, bought and sold within the same day. And they actually rebalance their accounts at the end of the day. So if the S&P 500 goes up, you know, 10%, and you have a 4X ETF here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be making four times that 10%. A lot of times it doesn't balance out like that. These are meant for very short-term positions. So people get frustrated when they see that holding this for a longer period of time, and this is in the prospectus. If you go and read the ETF prospectus for these, you can see the information there about how they balance it and what it's designed to do. So you have to be very careful careful in doing that. And if you're going to be going into like ETFs, just go into the normal ETFs. You don't have to go into these leveraged and inverse ETFs anymore. You don't need to do that. And if you wanna get real crazy, you could even do stock options instead of that. Instead of these tools that are not actually, it's like using, you know, a toy shovel to try and dig a hole instead of a, you know, a backhoe on a tractor. Looking at other areas of the market that are getting a little interesting right now, we've seen a sell-off in gold. So long term, you know, gold should be a good investment. It should be one of the hard assets that are going to go up with all of the money printing that is going on with interest rates low and the dollar not faring so well on international markets. Hard assets should be good. So why did gold go down? Well, we had the outcome of the election here. So that got rid of a lot of uncertainty and people know what to expect for the next four years in America. And then on top of that, you had this news about the pandemic, which has also helped the, the US stock market hit those records recently because people see the light at the end of the tunnel. There's vaccines coming out. Some of the Moderna vaccine has already been approved in other countries, although not the United States. You have the Pfizer vaccine. You have a number of these vaccines coming out in the next six months and people can see that there's gonna be a resolution on this. So going with that, gold has kind of sold off because it makes money on fear. If there is a fear or a, a turbulent situation in the marketplace, people flock to gold as a safety, as a safe haven. And now it's sold off a little bit because you know some of the things look a little bit brighter right now. But platinum, on the other hand, platinum didn't sell off. Platinum was actually up 14% just in the month of November. So why is all the interest switching from gold to platinum? Well, platinum right here is used in a lot of renewable energy companies and a lot of, a lot of resources and, and especially hydrogen fuel cells. You have a lot of use of platinum as an input into those industries. So what happened was you had Europe say that they were gonna go carbon neutral in the next 30 or 40 years. You had China come out with their next five-year plan and it also said that they wanna be carbon neutral. That's a lot of investment that's gonna be going into these renewable energy sources and should be driving up the price of platinum. Now, America, it's also part of the new policy here is that we're going more towards renewable energy. So again, you have three major areas of the world all going to this renewables and driving up the price of platinum. On top of that, you have lockdowns going on in the, well, the world's major producer of platinum is mines or are mines in South Africa. 
And what happened was these lockdowns occurred and they're not having the same output that they would normally. And think about that for the other metals as well and other commodities with lockdowns going on. We're going through a period of a lot of money being printed and right now it's not necessarily going into the standard marketplace, but when people start going outside again and start interacting with their environment and not being in a lockdown, it's gonna start driving up prices on commodities. And so with this lockdown, you're having a shortage of platinum right now. The actual demand for 2020 is expected to exceed supply by a record of 1.2 million ounces. And normally there's about seven or eight million ounces of platinum that go into industrial use every year. And you're seeing this extra demand now for this from the topics that we mentioned there. Next up, we have China continuing their, their dominance of the world. And what they just did right now was they sent a spacecraft, spacecraft up to the moon to collect lunar rocks. So this sounds like kind of not an exciting thing, but when you look at it from a bigger perspective, this is huge news. There's only been three countries in the history of the world that have sent a mission to the moon and returned lunar rocks, lunar material back down to earth. One was the United States of America, two was the Soviet Union when that was still around, and now three, I mean, this is gonna be China. They launched their vessel up there, it's called the Chang'e 5. And this mission should be coming back in mid-December. So we're gonna see if it's successful at that point, but we would assume that it would be successful. They already landed on the moon and everything. And you have to look at the bigger picture of this, of what's going on and what the objectives are here. China has announced that they actually want to put a base on the moon within the decade. So that's pretty significant there. And people are wondering, why are they interested in the moon? Like what's there that can give them an advantage, right? So it turns out that the moon actually has some valuable elements on it. If you look, they have helium-3 and they have rare earth elements that are hard to find on earth or not as abundant. And you can also take some of the elements that are on the moon to create fuel to propel rockets back down to earth. So there's a lot of different items there that can be mined and there's not really a lot of kind of international laws about how this would be done. So China kind of wants to get a head start before all that comes into place and starts hampering any ability to mine those resources. That's a, a potential, that's a speculation right there, but there was a lot of evidence to show that. And we also saw China, they did a lot of things before they crashed a, a vehicle on the moon a little while ago. Before that, they launched their, their different form of a GPS network. GPS is kind of by the United States. So China started launching their own satellites to make an alternative to the GPS network. They also launched something with quantum communications, which is basically an encryption form that the United States would not be able to break, nor would anybody else in the world if they're able to do it correctly. It's a intense form of encryption. And then they also sent a rover to Mars, which should be arriving there soon. So, I mean, they're going all out into space to see what kind of science and technology they can gain from doing those endeavors. Zoom reported earnings. So at first look, Zoom, which everybody loves during the pandemic and everybody's been using, it sounded like it was good earnings. They had 367% revenue growth. Then you look at like what they were looking at the future, they raised their outlook. They beat on earnings. They expected 329% revenue growth in the next quarter. That sounds pretty good. So all this sounds great, right? Well, the stock, the, the stock sold off 15% after this announcement which is pretty crazy. It's just that the expectations got so high with this company, and we've seen this in the past with other companies. What happens is, you know, everybody knows that Zoom was gonna do well during the pandemic, and the expectations keep getting higher and higher and higher for the company. And even if they are beating earnings, eventually those kind of people looking at it and analysts thinking what it can do, it just gets to the point where it's completely unreasonable and they can't meet the expectations, and then you have a bit of a sell-off. And it appears like that's happening a little bit here. The Q3 analysts were actually looking for $800 million in revenue, and they instead did $777.2 million in revenue. So you could see there, there was a little bit of a difference in the revenue, but then if you dive down into the numbers on revenue side, 38% of the revenue was from small businesses. And the problem is, is that during the pandemic, a lot of these small businesses are closing and they're not paying for additional services. And it's great that Zoom, you know, people going to school or people that just wanna interact with friends can use Zoom for free. The problem for Zoom and their earnings is that they need the big business accounts. They need 
the large corporations with you know over 500 employees you know with thousands of employees that they can sign up for their services and that's how they will make their money and right now they're they're not seeing that they're seeing these low margin customers and that's why you know this stock has been selling off after the news it was originally at 471 five days ago and then it went down to 410 dollars a share we also had the sales numbers from black monday come out and this is some information that was provided by adobe there was $10.8 billion in sales on a day. So that was an increase of 15% from last year. So Black Monday actually did better this year than it did it in 2019. The problem was Adobe was expecting $12.7 billion in sales. And a lot of those expectations also going on with the pandemic assumed a lot more people would be shopping online and there'd be a lot more transactions going back and forth. So why wasn't it a lot higher? You know, technically it should have been higher than it actually was. An interesting thing is going on with the U.S. corporate bond market. If you look at a chart, and this is something from the Bloomberg Barclays U.S. aggregate corporate bond yield against the inflation expectations. Like you have certain bonds like tips that kind of show the inflation expectations and the 10-year yield. So if you look at a chart of this, it actually shows that corporate bonds are now yielding less than the inflation expectations. So so basically, people that are buying these good corporate bonds now are actually planning to lose money. And this I don't think this has ever happened before. So you're seeing a lot of strange things happening in the debt markets right now because of Federal Reserve moving into those markets because of super low interest rates to save people from this pandemic. And when you have you know the Federal Reserve buying up tips and other bonds, it kind of is altering the process and the normal transactions that take place in this marketplace. And we can see that here. Next up, we have the cruise line stock Carnival, which has been on a tear lately. But for some strange reason, Chairman Mickey Arison sold $103 million worth of the stock. So people were looking at this and it was kind of like, you know, this the stock has increased tremendously. It's gone up 39.4% since September 30th. So that's still down 58% for the year. The stock is still cut in half from where it was before the pandemic. But a 39.4% in a few months is pretty incredible right there. So it looks like this might be some profit taking by the CEO here. But at the same time, when you're looking at it, he sold 5 million shares of the company on November 30th and made that money. Per share average price was $20.58. It's currently traded at $23.51, so it's even higher than now. And he's still the largest shareholder with 85 million shares. So even though he was selling it off, it might have just been to to make some profits on the side. And it looks like when you have a nice run-up like that, a lot of people like to take some profits. So when you look at the other cruise lines as well, you have Norwegian Cruise Lines and Royal Caribbean, and I believe Carnival was actually the largest one. A lot of the new investors into the market are betting on these plays with the pandemic ending that all these cruise ships are going to come back. These cruise companies are not going to go bankrupt. And that's why we've seen this tremendous return on there as people go into the risky plays. There was also some news in China. So China is allowing inter-China cruises or inter-Chinese city cruises in their country. But the problem is, is they're banning Norwegian Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean, and Carnival from operating within China on this. And China seems to be coming out of this pandemic a lot stronger than a lot of the other countries, but they are limiting what vessels can be transporting around within their country. So that wasn't good news for the cruise line stocks, but it doesn't matter because people believe that the pandemic's over there. Next up, we have CrowdStrike. So we have a couple of earnings here. CrowdStrike had a surprise here. They were up 12% after their quarterly earnings. And as we're expecting a slight loss of 212 point, a slight loss in earnings per share, and then a 212.6 million in revenue gained. And the actual company earned eight cents a share instead of having a loss, and then made 232.5 million in revenue. Another company that reported earnings, Splunk, their stock was down 21% after a huge disappointment here. Expectations were a, a loss of 51 cents a share, and then the real loss came in at $1.39 per share. And then the revenue was also lower than expectations. So Splunk just got really beat up there. 